moment, please. I think this is everybody just waiting for the intervener. Okay. Everybody should be able to hear now one moment here to open the record. The 37th Circuit Court is now in session with the Honorable Brian K. Kirk in presiding. It is Tuesday, October 1st, 2024 at 8.47 a.m. for 2019 to 687 D.C. or Cronkite v. Taylor Morgan and the interveners Jamie and Carlina Morgan, Attorney Reed for the plaintiff and Attorney Bartel for the defendant and the interveners. Good morning to everyone. I'll Good check morning, with uh, Ms. Morgan. I see she got up. I don't know if she's having any difficulties or or what. Ms. Reed, are you able to hear us now? Yes, I just couldn't hear anything before. Okay, great. Looks like everybody can hear and everybody's here as I was stating when we concluded on uh, September 19, 2024, the posts were with Mr. Bartel. So, Mr. Bartel, you can call your next witness. Yes, I called Jasmine Curtis. Okay. Uh, could you say that name again? I don't think I have. Jasmine Curtis. Um, I don't see that name here. I have a Susanna Hillman, Deborah Arnold, Stephanie Plain, Bill Cronkett, Clarissa Kilborn, and Allison Bartha. Do you have a Tyler Morgan? He was here earlier, but he has since dropped out of the Zoom waiting room. Okay. Uh, uh, Galen Curtis? I don't see that name here. Geez, 0 for 3. Uh, what's going on here today? Uh, let me... Those were my last few witnesses that shouldn't take long, Your Honor. And then I have Dr. Haugen, but he's not available till 9.30ish. Okay. So I need to. Okay. Why don't you mute yourself, call your witnesses, yep. and then we'll, we're not going to go off because we don't want to uh, lose anybody. I do have a Jasmine Curtis here. Okay. That was the first one that he mentions. Yes. Okay, Aaron, I do have Jasmine here now. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Curtis, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Ms. Curtis, we're going to take some testimony from you, so we have to have you sworn first. If you'd raise your right hand, we'll have you sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bartell. Thanks. Can you say your full name and spell your last for the record? Jasmine Camille Curtis, B-U-R-T-I-S. And do you know uh, Jamie Morgan and Carlina Toledo? Yes. And how do you know them? Um, I'm in a relationship. Okay. I'm sorry, we didn't hear that. We didn't hear that. I'm in a relationship with their son, Tyler Morgan. And how long have you been in a relationship with them? Um, over about two years and two months. Okay. And are you frequently over at Jamie Morgan and Carlina Toledo's house? I. I'm sorry, we didn't hear that. I live in. Did you say you live at the house? Yes. Okay. And how long have you been living there? Uh, since June of twenty. I'm going to be catching maybe every other word that she's saying. Maybe she can reconnect. Yeah, we're we're not hearing you now, Miss Curtis. So. Can you guys hear me better now? Yeah, we yes. could, we we could hear that. Could you hear that, Miss Reed? Yes. Okay. Why don't you? I don't know where you're sitting. Sometimes, if you're not close enough to the to the mic, so maybe you need to move closer. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, great. I can hear you all now. Okay, go ahead and ask the last question again, Mr. Bartel, so we can get Thank that on the record. Thank you. Uh, so how long have you been living at their house? Since June of 2023. And before June of 2023, how often would you be over at their house? Um every day to be honest i was going over every day after school and did you get to know chloe cronkite yes i did okay and i guess could you explain uh, why you got to know chloe Cron cronkite um well chloe is tyler's niece and 
Jamie and Carlina's granddaughter, and she would come over, so I would play with her. So I knew her. So when you said you didn't know knew her because she would come over, how often would she come over? Chloe came over frequently. Okay. And when you say frequently, would it be on a weekly basis? Yes. Okay. Approximately how many days a week would she come over? Well, she would come over every Wednesday. And then sometimes we would keep her on Wednesday nights. So, and then sometimes we'd keep her through the weekend. So sometimes two to four nights. On average per week? Yeah. And <clears throat> did you uh, see her interaction, Chloe's interaction with Jamie Morgan and Carlina Toledo? Yes, I did. And how, and how would you describe that for the court? I would say Chloe was very affectionate and like clingy with them she loved them she was, they're their grandparents did you at any time see any abuse by carlina or jamie towards chloe i'm sorry did you say abuse yes abuse no never and when i say abuse physical or mental abuse no sir okay was there ever any uh hesitation for chloe to go to uh jamie or carlina no. Could you just uh, describe what a routine day would be like when Chloe was over with Carlina and Jamie? Like when we would, like when she would stay the night or when she would get dropped off? Let, let's start when uh, she would spend the night. Okay, so we'd wake up in the morning. Carlina would take us to breakfast and then... We would sometimes we'd go get our nails done or we'd go to full blast or we'd go shopping. And then we'd go home clean. Me and Chloe would play with her Barbies in the bedroom. She would watch videos on the phone. She'd go to stores with Carlina and she'd take her bath, eat her dinner, go to bed, do it all over again. <laughs> Would Carlina be intimately involved in making sure that she was properly bathed and her hygiene was good? Yes, sir. And was she involved with uh, cooking dinners and making sure she was fed properly? Yes, sir. Okay. And what about uh, her clothing? Were her clothing needs met by Carlina and Jamie? Oh, more than definitely. <laughs> And when you say more than definitely, what do you mean by that? Oh, Chloe has so many clothes. <laughs> yeah. And did she have um, toys over there? Oh, yes. So many. <laughs> yeah. And what type of toys would she have over there? Well, she has Barbies. She has baby dolls. You like, you know, the mini brand toys. She has a bunch of those. Um. She has the Beanie Babies, a bunch of stuffed animals. She has books. And did Chloe have her own bedroom there? Yes. Okay. And that was her bedroom only? Yes. She still has her own bedroom. It's still there. It's not like it's gone. It's still waiting for her, you know? Okay. And could you describe the bedroom? For the court? Well, we painted it all pink and it's pink and it's white and purple. She has a big old white bed with a nice bed frame. She has a white, it's like a whole bedroom outfit. She has the dresser with the big old mirror. She has her her big old dollhouse. She has her closet, which is full of clothes, and she has her bucket full of toys and all her books and shoes are on the other side of the closet. She has a TV. Everything a kid could wish for, to be honest. <laughs> and did she ever have pictures of anyone up in her bedroom? Yes, sir. Okay, and what pictures would she have up? She had pictures of her and her mother. Did there ever come a time that those pictures were taken down? 
Yeah, there was a time that they got taken down, but um, Chloe came when she came back over. She put them back up. So do you recall? Do you recall the reason why those pictures were taken down? Yeah, Kelsey yeah. said that we need. Well, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. I uh, let me ask you this. You were beginning to say Kelsey said. Uh, did Kelsey? Did you ever hear Kelsey? say the reason to take pictures down yeah she said that we needed well sorry 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 um well just yes or no did you hear it from kelsey yes. and when you say kelsey you mean kelsey cronkite yes okay what did she say she said that we needed to take the pictures down of i'm gonna object to how this is relevant to grandparenting time and it's hearsay well, the, with regards to hearsay, I had already confronted Miss Cronkite with regards to this, so it is impeachable, Your Honor. So that is an exception. With regards to the relevance, as I indicated with the case law out there, it is actually actually a lot of case law that suggests that the connection between the mother and, and the child in this particular situation, it is highly relevant, especially if we're talking about the connection that is maintained or not maintained by plaintiff. Okay, any response, Ms. Reed? I still don't see how pictures being taken down and put back up is relevant to the grandparenting time claim when the case law that Mr. Bartell cited, the parents were deceased and the mother in this case is not deceased. All she has to do with her connection is pick up the phone. Well, with regards to your honor, if I could respond is it, yeah. it was deceased and, and the professional that unfortunately counsel omitted said deceased, but the testimony was deceased or the parent is gone for a period of time. So that is why it's relevant. And that's not the only case that's out there. I just cited the public published case. Okay, well, obviously, uh, as Mr. Bartell stated, it's for impeachment purposes and, uh, and obviously for others that are relevant, the court is going to overrule the objection. Uh, Ms. Curtis, I guess I'll ask it again. What did specifically Ms. Cronkite, the best you recall, stated regarding the pictures? That they were, that she didn't like them and that they were upsetting and that Chloe, um, they were making Chloe sad. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Did you ever get the impression that those pictures were making Chloe sad? No, I didn't. And let me back up. You had talked about a general day when you guys would wake up. Uh, let me ask you, what was a general day when she would either be dropped off or you guys would pick her up? Wednesdays. Well, no. So what What was a general... When she, let me rephrase that. Sorry. So when you, you guys would get uh, Chloe... Uh, was she usually dropped off, or how did that occur? Yeah, she was usually dropped off. Or we, and by who? Oh, yeah. Well, when school started, then we picked her up from the bus. Okay. Um, did Kelsey Cronkite ever drop off uh, Chloe? Yes. Okay. I guess describe those times that um, Chloe was dropped off by Kelsey. Uh, well, Kelsey would drop Chloe off, and then Kelsey would bring Chloe to the door. They would just walk in our house, and then we'd get Chloe. Like, and then okay. you mean like after? Chloe? So, so let me ask you: uh, Did Chloe's attitude change when she was with you as opposed to with Kelsey? Yes. Could you describe that to the court? I feel like when. Chloe was dropped off. She was very quiet and like she was she was not as open. And then like once she was there and she knew that it was okay, like she like she changed like instantly. She was just bright and happy and clingy and she stuck on to you and she was a okay. whole different person, I feel like. Okay. So she became a different person once Kelsey left. Yeah. Could you describe uh, how 
Chloe would act when Kelsey would come pick her up? Uh, she would, she would cry. She would get upset. She would scream. And then Carlina and Jamie would be like, come on, honey, let's go. You got to go home. You know, you're going to come back soon. It's okay. And, you know, she would cheer up, but like, she would be quiet when she left. She wasn't the same as what she was, even when she was just 10 minutes ago, you know? Can you, um, did uh, Jamie and Carlina take care of uh, Chloe when she was sick? Yes. Were there any times when they had to either uh, specifically get Chloe because she was sick? Yes, I specifically remember one time when she had um, strep throat. Could you describe that? What happened? Um, we were told that we needed to come pick Chloe up because they weren't able to take care of everyone who was sick. So we needed to come and take Chloe so that we could take care of her, basically. So how many days did you take care of Chloe? Or did, did everyone help take care of Chloe? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, so how, how many days did Carlina and Jamie have to take care of Chloe? Well, when she had that strep throat, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure it was three to four days because I remember them saying that the 72 mark was up so that she was fine. And do you recall what uh, what the grandparents did to take care of Chloe with strep throat? Yeah, she had a little soup, Sprite, and all her um, medicines. And who provided those medicines, if you know? Carlina. Do you believe that uh, Chloe had a bond with Carlina and Jamie? I do. Okay. And why do you say that? Because she's their princess. Like, the way that she just loved on them when she was around. She, like, when I mean she literally flung on to them, I mean, like, she would sit on their lap and wrap her arms around their neck and just tell them how much she loves them. You know, like she was so affectionate with them. Do you recall if she ever approached them with a problem? I guess, to, and don't, don't say any hearsay as to what she said, but do you recall her ever going to them with a problem that she had or an issue? There was one time at their house, yes, when we picked her up from well, the bus. Okay, let me back up. I mean, would she go to Carlina or Jamie if she if there was an issue going on? Oh, yes, every time. Oh, okay, okay. She she didn't appear to have any fear going to them if there was an issue going on. No, sir. Um, how would you describe whether or not Jamie and Carlina could put their her needs before their own? Her needs before theirs? Yes. Would they put her needs before their own? Yes. Sir. And was there ever a time in which 
you had concern that there was abuse by Kelsey Cronkite towards Chloe? Yes. Not okay, that. Could you Not, well, I don't, I'm not sure if it was by Kelsey or by Ori, but that's what I was just saying with the one time when we picked her up from the bus. Okay, so there was a, do you remember that time you were picking her up from bus that you were referencing? Yes. When was that? Oh, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember it was a Wednesday after school around four o'clock. Okay. And so you were there with whom? Carlina. Okay. Was anyone else there? Kelsey and the little boy, Gio, the little son. Okay. Did there come a point that Kelsey said something that made you concerned about the safety of Chloe? Yes. And can you say, can you tell me what that statement was? that they had whooped her. I'm ass. gonna object, Your Honor, as hearsay. Okay. Impeachment again, Your Honor. Impeachment again, Your Honor. I confronted Ms. Cronkite with regards to that. Ms. Reed, what's your response? I don't recall Ms. Cronkite being confronted about being accused of whooping the kids after school one day. I, th I think her conversation was, or her testimony was that uh, He'd asked her about any abuse that occurred, and she denied that, is my recollection. Is that what you're referring to, Mr. Bartown? Well, it was that, and I had confronted her, as I recall, asking whether or not she had told Carlina that uh, she whooped her ass, or that someone whooped her ass, and that's how we do it around here. I will take it uh, conditionally upon, uh, obviously, able to... Uh, I guess you'd say to establish that from her testimony, I have to go back and look, but I'll I'll take it conditionally at this point. Okay. Ms. Curtis, uh, what did uh, Ms. Cronkite state to you? That they had whooped her ass because Chloe didn't want to go play in the bedroom with the boys because that's how they do it around there. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait to go off. And um, is there, have you seen any uh, drug use or or the such with regards to Jamie or Carlina Toledo? No. Are you aware of any mental or physical health problems that they have that would preclude them from taking care of their granddaughter? No, sir, I'm not. Did you ever witness any hostility by Jamie or Carlina towards Ori Cronkite? No, sir. Did you ever hear them bad mouth Ori in front of Chloe? No, sir. I truly never heard them bad mouth Ori until all of this has happened. And so that was never in front of the minor child? Never at all in general. Oh, okay. And did you ever hear either of them tell Chloe that Ori is not her father? No, sir, I have not. Was there ever through statements or oh, yeah. any other action by Jamie or Carlina that showed that they were trying to destroy or alter the relationship between Chloe and Ori? No, sir. And so would you ever see uh, Jamie or Carlina engage in educational activities with Chloe? Yes, actually. Yeah, we all did. Okay. And what type of educational activities would be engaged? Um, 
Carlina would go out and buy activity books that had the um like the letters that you can trace or the numbers but um Chloe was starting to learn how to write names so she was asking how to write all of our names like Nana and Papa and Jamie and Tyler Jasmine you know Grandma Gloria like a bunch she was going on a list and so when was the last time you saw Chloe? The last time I saw Chloe was in December. Of 2023? Yes, the beginning of December 2023. Let me ask, so was there any indication from Chloe that she was in fear of Jamie or Carlina the last yeah. time that she saw them? No, sir. She actually, I had taken taken a picture of Carlina and Chloe hugging because Carlina had given her those Christmas ears. But there was no indication of any no, uh, sir. hesitance or shy or anything uh, that she didn't want to be around uh Jay or Carlina? No, sir. I have no further questions, Ryan. Okay. Ms. Reed, any cross examination? Just briefly, Ms. Curtis, you said that you had not heard. Um, the grandparents badmouth Ari until all of this happened. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So they have been badmouthing Ari since then? I'm sorry, what? So first it was you have not heard them badmouth Ari until all of this happened. Correct, since we stopped seeing Chloe. And have they been making disparaging comments about Ari since you stopped seeing Chloe? I mean, that's what I said. Yeah, they bad-mouthed him after we stopped seeing Chloe. Okay. I mean, it's not like it was too, like, I guess I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, anything else, Ms. Bartel? Just briefly, I mean, were those conver were those conversations in private? Yes, that's what I was oh. trying to like get to. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was gonna say it's um, not like it was to a room full of a bunch of people. Uh, was it on a regular basis that they were bad mouth? No. Okay. What did it come across as frustration? I guess on their part. Yes, sir. Okay. No further questions. Okay, Miss Reed. Anything else? Okay. Ms. Curtis, I'll conclude your testimony. You're free to go. Have a good day. Thank you. I guess I would uh, call Caitlin Curtis if okay. she's there. I don't see, but I have, a, I have Tyler Morgan now. I don't have Tyler Morgan on the witness list. Aaron, what was that first name you said again? Caitlin no unless she's just with one of these other people I do not see her here okay um I'm trying to see if I got a number here Let me tell you the names I have. I have um, Allison Bartha, Clarissa Kilborn, Bill Cronka, Deborah Arno, Susanna Gilman, Tyler Morgan, and Stephanie Plain. Okay. Um, you know, I will just uh, 
try to get a whole area in between, I guess. Um, I guess I would call Tyler Morgan. Okay. I'm going to object to this witness, Your Honor. It wasn't he was not disclosed on the witness list that was required. Okay, Mr. Bartel. You know, Your Honor, we don't have to have him because I think it's cumulative, probably times six by now. So I, I guess in the expediency as best that can be. Okay. Well, if he's not on the list, the court's not going to allow him to testify. So that's we, fine, Your Honor. We can uh, we can dispense with Mr. Morgan. Um, I text uh, Dr. Hogan about a minute ago, uh, so he'd be my next one, Your Honor. Okay. So let me see if I can give him a quick call. And So am I removing Tyler Morgan? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Must have been Reed. Did we lose Miss Reed? Yes, we just did now. I apologize. Everyone froze, and then it looked like Zoom crash. Okay, well, you were you were the only one that we lost. So, who's obviously your your unit? I just talked to Doctor Haugen. He said he was in. Let me see. This might be. This might be him. Let's see. Okay, are you, Dr. Haugen, are you able to hear us? I can. I can hear you. Thank you, Jan. Okay, great. We're going to take some testimony from you, so have you raise your right hand and be sworn in, then we'll proceed. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bartel. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you state your name spelling their last for the record? Randall E. Haugen, H-A-U-G-E-N. And where do you work? I'm a licensed psychologist at Battle Creek Counseling Associates. And and uh, what is your title there? I'm a licensed psychologist. And how long have you been at that job? I've been in um, private practice since 1990. <clears throat> and what are some of your, uh, I guess, uh, duties and job responsibilities? And individual group family therapy, as well as I, um, um, evaluations, um, both for attorneys, for the court, for um, um, private individuals. Okay. Just some background, where did you attend school? I have a bachelor's degree in science and nursing from Andrews University. I have a master's in psychology from Michigan University. A PhD in psychology from um, um, Andrews University and completed my postdoc requirements um, and exam for licensure. Um, have you given any lectures? Yes, I've, I've given numerous lectures to, um, in different areas, yes. Okay. Um, and do you have, uh, do you specialize in any particular field? Um, I specialize in um, psychological evaluations, um, different areas. Like um, um, I do a lot of um, work with abuse and neglect, trauma, and um, um, evaluations for the court related to competency, criminal responsibility, phase two waiver evals, and others. Do you ever deal with, I guess, the relationship between uh, grandparents and grandchildren? Yes. Okay, and I mean, has that been 
I guess how often have you done that? Um, hundreds of times uh, over the years. Have you been ever qualified as an expert? Yes. And um, in what particular courts have you been qualified as an expert? Um, 11 courts in Michigan. Does that include Calhoun County? Yes. Yes. And including and including before this particular court? Yes. And have you been qualified as an expert in family relationships or I, could you describe that, I guess? Yes, I've been um, qualified in the area of abuse and neglect, psychology in general, um, children, adults. Um, I've been qualified with um, violent offenders, sex offenders. And I mean, I forgot to ask you, do you have board certifications? Yes, I'm a licensed psychologist. Yes. And remind me, how many years has that been? I've been um, in various forms since 1990. And in this particular matter, um, you you haven't uh, seen the particular child, uh, Chloe Cronkite, correct? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. And uh, you have been asked to come in and uh, give some testimony uh, based upon your experience as a psychologist in the family arena. Is that correct? That's what I understood, yes. And, and Your Honor, I guess I would, I would move to the mission of Dr. Haugen as an expert in the family, including dynamics between grandparents, children, um, in this particular matter. Okay. Ms. Freed, anything, any voir dire you have? I do. Um, Dr. Haugen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, have you ever been qualified as an expert witness in a case about grandparenting time? Um, grandparenting time specifically, no parenting time, um, numerous times. Okay. And as you stated, you have not seen the child in question in this case? Yes, I have not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And you have no information about this child? No information. Okay. Have you ever spoken to the grandparents, Carlina Toledo or Jamie Morgan? No, not to my knowledge, no. Have you spoken to any witnesses in this case? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you received any information about this case in particular? I was told the case was related to grandparenting rights um, with a child whose mother is incarcerated. And where did you gain that information from? From um, Attorney Bartel. Okay. But there have been no evaluations done for this case? Correct. What materials or documents did you review from preparation for today? I didn't review any materials. Okay. Did you review any sort of family history or records prior to coming to today? No. Do you have an opinion regarding grandparenting time as it relates to this case? As it relates to this case, no. My knowledge is... Um, my, and experience relate to um, general knowledge about dynamics, um, um, the outcome research, and what works the best in those type of situations. But they all vary. Um, but, you know, there are individual factors to consider. And are you being paid for your testimony today? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. How many times did you speak with Mr. Bartell about this case? Um. I'm going to object to relevance, Your Honor. Well, I think it's probably relevant to get to, uh, again, the background, so I'll allow it and overrule the objection. I did talk to him, but it was mainly over issues of my schedule and how to negotiate it. Uh, was that like once? 
that was twice. Okay. I have no further questions for um, Ms. Dr. Haugen, but I would object to him being a qualified as an expert witness as he does not meet the qualifications under MRE 702. He has not interviewed the child. He has not interviewed the parents. He has not interviewed the grandparents. Um, and MRE 702 requires that the expert scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will help the trier of fact understand evidence or determine a fact and issue. And I don't believe Dr. Haugen, although I do respect him in all the other general areas that he's testified in, um, cannot help the court in this case in any of that realm, as Dr. Haugen does not have any facts to apply to this case. So I don't see how any of his testimony is going to be relevant and general knowledge or just general grandparenting time might be good is not the standard to rebut the presumption or in the best interest factors regarding the grandparenting time statute. And I know under Keenan, there was an expert testifying generally in Keenan, but Keenan's very different from this case in that Keenan, the parent was deceased. That expert was not qualified as an expert. It was just a general counselor. And that ex that person had contact with the grandparents and was testifying primarily based on concerns regarding relationships with siblings for the child in Keenan, as well as fostering and creating that memory of the deceased parent. So I don't believe Dr. Haven will be relevant for this case. Okay, Mr. Bartell, your response. Yes, Your Honor, uh, as was testified by Dr. Haugen, um, there was, well, first of all, let me say this, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Haugen has testified as an expert in general in the past uh, concerning family dynamics uh, uh, with regards to parenting time, et cetera. And that is similar here as, as to the grandparent uh, Pair, uh, grandchild relationship, Your Honor. Uh, this court uh, has the ability to allow an expert to be qualified or someone to be qualified as an expert in a general field. Uh, uh, counsel on the other side misstates that law. It, they do not have to have interviews with people that can give this court and aid this court in understanding the dynamics uh, generally out there. Uh, with respect to uh, whether it's parenting time and family dynamics, which Dr. Haugen has the plethora of experience, over 30 years of experience. He has the ability to help this court aid in, in those dynamics. He has uh, indicated that he has read literature with regards to this. He has uh, clinical experience in this area. And like I said, he can give the aid to the court as to general issues uh, that are out there. With regards to Keenan, Your Honor, uh, counsel needs to stop saying that it's just when a parent passes. That, and it's in the opinion, uh, the psychologist testified, and this is word for word, about harms that a young child can suffer when a parent dies or, or is not around. And that part of the family is, quote, cut off from the child. Trial court concluded that the other parents' decision to deny child time with deceased mother's parents would cause substantial harm to the child, given substantial likelihood that minor child will have an inability to remember the mother. And that's not the only case out there. There's other cases that deal with not just the death, but the mission of expert testimony as to general uh, testimony about harms that can occur, Your Honor. And this court is smart enough to make those reasonable inferences with regards to that. So I would ask for the him be qualified as an expert. Okay. Any response, Ms. Reed? Yes, Your Honor. The court rule is very direct of the knowledge and skill of the trier of fact to understand the evidence and determine a fact at issue. I don't believe that that is the case with Dr. Hagman's testimony and testimony in D in MRE 702, the expert's opinion reflects reliable application of the principles and methods to the facts of this case. Dr. Haugen says he doesn't have an opinion about this case. He doesn't have the facts of this case. And so he's not qualified as an expert witness. And I don't believe any of his testimony is relevant. Well, 
Okay. In this particular matter, obviously, the issue is uh, is this is a Daubert uh, challenge in the court uh, in these particular cases is obviously the gatekeeper, and Daubert was decided back in 1994, and uh, that pursuant to the uh, Michigan legislature enactment of, again, 600.2955 back in 1995, uh, in the greenhouse, in response to greenhouse and roads, uh, basically they attempted, it was an attempt to uh, codify Daubert in Michigan. And uh, that, in fact, occurred back in 2003 when the uh, Supreme Court amended MRE 702. And basically they said to explicitly incorporate Daubert's standard of reliability. Obviously, Daubert attempted to incorporate Fry, and as a general accepted, that was changed, obviously, and uh, with the uh, amendment of MRE 2, or excuse me, 702, it was revised to require that an expert be based on sufficient facts or data, be the product of reliable principles and methods, and be the product of reliable uh, apply, uh, reliably applying the principles and methods to the fact of the case. Uh, in this uh, particular matter, when the court does that in this particular matter, the, the parties have cited to the Keenan case, uh, 2007 case. Uh, in Keenan, obviously, the uh, court stated that the Appeals court stated the court should not simply grant parenting time merely because the evidence demonstrated that grandparenting time was beneficial, uh, but that the grandparent must provide concrete evidence of supports that the denial would pose a substantial risk of harm in these uh, particular matters. What happens is under Daubert and uh, again the codification, uh, the issue is whether. The testimony is based upon sufficient facts or data. The testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods, and the witness has applied the principles and method reliably to the facts of the case. Uh, I think what's being offered by Dr. Haugen is, again, addressing the application of the, I guess you'd say, I don't want to say background, but uh, effectively it is background uh, evidence generally, as he stated, to be qualified as it relates to fam in the family arena, arena or the dynamics to a case such as this. Obviously, Dr. Haugen has testified as an expert in my court, as I know in many other courts. And this is, I guess you'd say this is a little bit different because we do have, as a part of the case, is that the court has to make a best interest analysis as well. And as it relates to the best interest analysis, there's a lot of things that the court has to consider. And one of those, uh, obviously, is, or many of those, pertain to relationships in general in uh, these particular cases. And as additionally, that the uh, the factors under the uh, statute rel relating to the best interest. And some of those can be obviously extrapolated from general testimony. And uh, so the court does believe that uh, Dr. Haugen's testimony would be relevant to those particular factors and would, uh, again, shed light in this matter as it relates to the family dynamics and the dynam dynamics of uh the impact it would have upon the child generally. And I think the court and I, uh, has taken the testimony of the other various witnesses that would supplement and make the application of that to the facts of this case that the court could consider. So the court is going to overrule uh, the objection to Dr. Haugen and allow him to testify as it relates, again, generally to the uh, area of the, fi the family arena and the dynamics relating in this uh, particular case 
and the court then will give it sufficient weight as appropriate in this matter at that time. So, Dr. Haugen, you are able to testify. Mr. Bartell, you can continue. You're muted, Mr. Bartell. Thank you. Dr. Haugen, uh, can you generally talk about the loss of a parent going to prison for a child? <clears throat> and I, I'm talking in general now. We do know that um, it, it's, it, it certainly can be traumatic for the child and uh, the, related to the loss of a parent. And that's somewhat contingent on the uh, um, amount of time the parent spent with the child and the quality of that relationship. But even, in, even if it's um, been somewhat strained, it's a loss for the child and it is traumatic. Um, and we do know um, through research that the maintaining regular and consistent contact with the parent can minimize the um, damage that it occurs to the child, as well as improve the overall functioning of the mother or father, depending on who's in there. Um, so efforts, we try to make efforts to um, minimize that um, trauma that the child uh, is experiencing as well as the adult by setting up a program for regular contact. And that's, that's um, from, from a developmental standpoint, there's different needs at different developmental stages. For example, with an infant, you would wanna um, have the mother, uh, just an example, to um, tape her voice so the infant hears her voice and um, um, has endearing visitation um, before with the the baby during a prison time, you'd want the you would want that set up and, and structured. So you and you measure what's the impact of it. Um, there's there's a loss for the child, not only of the parent of the parent, but extended family. It could be the school they lose, the place they were, um, the type of place they were living. Maybe there's horses, dogs, or um, the losses extend pretty broadly with a, a child. So um, we, we try to structure to minimize all that so that the child receives the contact with a parent that's appropriate and, and maintains the semblance of a relationship with them. Have you dealt with the situations where one of the parents was incarcerated and yeah. the dynamic? Yes, numerous times, yes. Okay. And what kind of uh, plan generally do you try to set up for the maintaining that contact? Um, letters. We have letters that, um, that they share back and forth. And eventually, I found that uh, the contact becomes more deep. And they're usually, uh, at first, superficial. Mm -hmm. And later on, they become more deep, like, what did you do? What happened? Why did you do that? Um, we have, we'll structure visitation so that they they go there. Um, we have the, depending on the age of the child, we'll have them draw pictures, send schoolwork, and send it to the parent so the parent can respond. Um, that we, um, we help them establish a narrative. Um, including uh, uh, if they had good relationships with uncles, aunts, or anybody in the family, we try to maintain that so they can um, they can maintain um, a uh, internalization of that parent as um, uh, um, in, in a more positive way. So if that doesn't happen, and I know we're talking about in general, but if that doesn't happen, maintaining that contact, including the extended family, as I hear, uh, what could happen? What in well, your experience in well, the literature? What yeah, what ha has happened to me directly is that it's harder for the child to reattach to the um, to the um, parent who's incarcerated in their family, and I've had it on many occasions where. There's a really a lot of tension between the families, so that affects the child's attitudes and internalizations of the 
there um, of that family, you know, because the uh, most I've dealt with is the other parents, the mother or father is pretty angry at the other parent. So they um, construct him in the child's mind as being bad, horrible, and he's done terrible things. So with that internalization, it's more difficult to attach. Um, now, obviously, if there's the, the mother or father was an ax murderer, you know, and they're a psychopath, and they can never, you know, you, you would balance that based upon what the other person is, or they've never had an attachment before. What are their prior attachments? So that would all have to be assessed. And you want to simulate that as much as possible. And so let me, let me flash something out that I think I heard. You had indicated the tension between the family members and internalization of the child. Are you saying that if a child is with one particular parent and there is tension and stuff going on, there's a chance of the, that minor child internalizing all that and having a negative view towards the other parent or family? Correct. Which okay. often, unfortunately. Say that again. I'm sorry, you cut out for me. Which which happens often, unfortunately, because there's a, was a previous a lot of um, tension in that relationship, and it kind of carries on through. And in most cases, we're talking. I don't know about this kid, but the the parent sees an opportunity to eliminate the other parent. Mom, he's incarcerated. Mom says. Um, Finally, I get the child to myself, and then the child then has however long the parents incarcerated, um, kind of indoctrinated by um, the other parent is that they're bad and he's bad and horrible. So it's really difficult to get them to reattend. And you said you see that often that that happens. When I used to do that, yes, I saw it all. I've dealt with this clinically. I've dealt with it personally. You know, with my own, own. I have, we have a daughter who's schizophrenic, and she was incarcerated, and I and I adopted the child. We had to, I had to maintain that relationship. My daughter's mentally ill; she's schizophrenic, so I had to maintain that relationship and let them know that this isn't your fault. This is what happens. Going to explanatory type stuff and facilitate that relationship as much as I could based upon how she was functioning at that time. And I still do. Okay. And you do that because, at least in your personal life, based upon other clinical experience and the literature, you think that that is important. Yeah, uh, it is demonstrated uh, even clinically and um the research and attachment. If you go, if you want some research on that, go to the Department of Corrections and sites and talk about parent connections and attachments. It's obviously they need more research, just like everything. We do know that it's when it's done appropriately, the children and um, the incarcerated individual do better. So, with regards to, um, I guess, the tension. If there's been testimony that the father's current wife, so stepmother of the grandchild, bashes mother who's in prison, is that the type of behavior you're talking about that will affect the child? Yes, that would be, if that's happening, that would be something that needs to be overcome, yes. And, and generally, um, if that is done over an extended period of time, what can happen to the child with regards to the view towards the mother? Well, if it's, the, if it's a mother, they, it disrupts that relationship and view of the mother as someone that can, she, he can have a relationship with he or she, I guess. And so does that also, that... <laughs> Continuing contact, if I understood from you, that how can help with the transition of reunification when that parent that is incarcerated gets out? 
Yes, it does. Correct. Yes. If it's structured and appropriate, absolutely. And what what about the contact with that incarcerated family? Can you shed any light for this court and us as to the importance of keeping that contact? Well, that that helps maintain the attachment. And because uh, let's say there's an uncle that the child was with quite a bit. That, that's happened to me. And then uh, the, the parent, his brother, his father gets incarcerated and he just stops going fishing. He stops hanging out with him. He stops doing things. That's a big loss for a child. And um, if, if you can maintain that, you can um, minimize the, the trauma related to that loss um, and both end up doing better. Plus the, the, the uncle continues to carry on the narrative as long as he's appropriate, you know, it's important that those things be dealt with and um, carries on a narrative related to his family so the child can internalize that. Is it a traumatic event or can it be, I should ask you, can it be a traumatic event for a grandchild to abruptly not be seen their grandparents that they saw on a regular basis. When I say regular basis, if the testimony is two, three, four times a week, including overnights, would that be a traumatic event? Could it be? Yes, absolutely. And could you? It's a loss. Yeah. Yes. And and and, and could you tell us even on that dynamic? So separate from even the parent that's incarcerated. How can that negatively affect the minor child, not having that contact with the grandparents or any family member for that matter? I guess the, the, the traumatic part would be the grief and loss that establishes the emotional remnants of that. Is it different for someone that maybe let's say an older child, like 16 years old, as opposed to a younger child that's five or six, where there's a abrupt change in that connection or visitation with that extended family? Well, the each child is different based upon their attitudes, their temperament and their background and their experience with it. Um, the only advantage to a, like a 16 year old is that their developmental task is to individuate and become uh, separate. You know, that's why you get the rebelliousness. So and, and an older child has the ability to process it more and put it into words and construct meaning where the younger child needs more help in, um, in um, developing that. So developing is that to suggest that Oh, go ahead. Developing meaning of what occurred, right? Not that the 16-year-old does, but um, language skills for 16-year-olds generally higher. Um, their ability to conceptualize uh -huh. the abstract thinking is higher, which makes it easier. Can it be more confusing for a younger child at, at the age of five or six as opposed to an older one if there's that abrupt change? It can be, yes. And that's because they're in a different developmental stage that they may not fully comprehend what's going on? That's correct, yes. So I got a question <clears throat> with regards to, is there a benefit of the extended family, meaning the other side of the family, like grandparents? that had close contact with a minor child to maintain that relationship with the incarcerated parent versus the other parent maintaining that relationship? Yes. And There's a benefit, describe... benefit in terms of minimizing the traumatic impact, both on a short-term and long-term basis, 
and if the child's going to um, um, if the child is going to have continued contact, um, that, that's particularly mm -hmm. important. And I don't, I don't know the details of the case or if the parent has 20 years in, to serve, that's different than three years, you know, because in three years, you got to prepare to reunify. 20 years, it's different. Um, and uh, the situations are different. So if in this particular case, the mother was going to be out, let's say within even three or four years, you're saying that would be a be an extreme benefit to have that connection still with the child? Yeah, if, if the plan is eventually for the mother to um, reunify with the child to some degree, it certainly would be beneficial. And let me circle back. I guess maybe my question wasn't as good. Is, is there like an actual additional benefit to ensure that that child has that connection with the incarcerated parent by being with the extended family over the actual parent that is not incarcerated? If that um, if that individual from the family had a prior attachment and relationship, you want it would it, and they're appropriate, of course. It would um, it would be um, a, 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 um, something that helps prevent and minimize the trauma that the child experiences. So that the extended family can ensure that they maintain that relationship for the minor child and minor child. It, would the minor child feel more comfortable on that side of the family with that connection? They would experience less of a sense of loss. Now, there's been suggestion that the reason for the stopping of communication 100% between the grandparents and the grandchild in this case is because the grandmother was telling the grandchild that the father was not her father. Let me, so if that is what the allegation is on the other side, is that an insurmountable issue to deal with, in your opinion? It's a big issue that would need to be dealt with. But if the child had a significant attachment in the past, it would. I would try to work with it. I'd find out why. If it, you know, what was the, um, <laughs> where was the information source? How was it constructed? Um, um, and I, I would investigate that. And if I find the child is, um, he, there, there's been significant boundary violations on an ongoing basis, then um, doing something with that contact um, certainly would be uh, an option. Well, is it any different than one parent disparaging another parent during a divorce? No, it's not different. So um, you, you see that a lot, would you agree? Yes. And those issues can be overcome? They can be overcome if everybody agrees to work together. Okay. Um, so part of the key is if people are trying to work together. Yes. Okay. And do you think it's in the best interest of a minor child for even a parent to say, I'm not going to try to work with the grandparents on whatever issues may be there? Depending on the past relationship and how deep the relationship and how frequent, it would be better for the parent to work with the grandparents to help maintain that. So if you encountered a case where there was frequent contacts, like I said, two, three, four times a week, for over a several year period, including overnights. I mean, would that be in the best interest of the child for the parent to work with the grandparents? Yes, with the information you give me, yes, unless the grandparents were 
somehow abusive, of course, but um, yes, it would be beneficial. I guess I want to, I, I guess I want to ask your, I ask you about the ability of a five or six year old to conceptualize time. Have you dealt with that in the past? Yes, particularly during the evaluation process. Time, okay. or, uh, um, time, or what we call temporal sequencing, doesn't occur until a child's a little older. Maybe not in terms of that, and uh, I'm sorry, you broke out, Doctor Haugen. What age? Um, um, depending on the child, their developmental level, the level of intelligence, it's usually around eight, nine, and ten where they can begin to get a concept of time where last week means something. Okay. And so if a child said something happened on a particular day of the week and it happened three, four months ago, would that give you concern if they were five or six years old? Uh, just to clarify, they're saying, um, if the child tells me a few months ago something happened on a Tuesday, it would be um, it would be subject to evaluation. Yes, uh, it would be rare that a child could do that. And why is that? Their the temporal sequencing isn't very well developed. Is there some, so what process would you go through if a child five years old comes to you and gives you some something happened on a Tuesday months ago? And what, what process would I do in the interview? Yeah, I mean, how would you address that? I mean, if I understand that would be of some concern because there is the temporal sequencing is not there yeah. at that age. So how would you, if, if they were making an allegation of something happening on a Tuesday months ago, how would you deal with that? From a clinical standpoint, I would I would ask more about it. Say it was Tuesday. How do you uh, um, how do we know, know it's Tuesday? What did you do on Wednesday? You know how how do you know it's Tuesday? And I would um, I would uh, look for details related to that. And I would also talk to the parents, um, talk to what was going on that day, you know, and um, I would seek more collateral information related to it. And so is it fair to say you would investigate that more and not just rely on the child? Correct. For, for that type of information, yeah. It would be more reasonable if the child said during Christmas time, everybody got in a big fight. And ruin my Christmas. So uh, yeah, they could do that, but to come up with an arbitrary date and time for a five-year-old, I, I can, I'm not sure I could do that. You know, what what did I do three months ago on a Tuesday? I don't know. So um, it would be subject to uh, more inquiry. Are children at the age of five and six more, more impressionable than older children? Yeah, they can be. Uh, yes, they, yes. Depending on the child, but from a, a general developmental level, yes, they're more impressionable. And so if certain things are happening at home, they're being told certain things, um, such as mother is a bad person or mother's going to be in prison forever, things like that. Generally, how do children internalize that? Well, it... it um they would internalize the other parent negatively and that they could be bad. They may feel guilt about it. You know, um, even at that age, children feel guilt about it and they, then they grieve and they feel sad. They, um, and they need permission to feel sad and grieve and um, realize that the other parents are not feeling that way, which helps them. And they can bury it. Then we see more, patterns of acting out and behavioral disturbances. And at some point, does that child start having the same view as the parent at home? 
yes towards, towards the one that's incarcerated yes and why is that well um one of the learning methods of children is you know um modeling and they learn it vicariously that uh we tend to adopt the attitudes and beliefs of our parents at that age. An example would be, you know, uh, some elementaries, I'm not sure I agree with it. They, they say, um, are you, um, would you vote for Trump or you vote for um, yeah, Harris, you know, and who's a Harris? Who's a, and they generally go with where their parents are at, you know, so. They tend to internalize the same perceptions and ideas and with their parents at that age. So if a child about five or six years old was in counseling and made some allegation towards the grandparents numerous months after being in counseling, how would you in general deal with that situation? If they made allegations that like the, what I told you before, in this case, the allegation is that grandmother has told the grandchild that the father is not the grandchild's real father and had taken the child to some random house to show the child who the true father was. So let's say three months into counseling, you hear that. What would three, you do? They've been three months. Three, they've been in counseling three months? Yes. Or I think I heard that, or they haven't seen a counselor in three months. No, they, they were three months into counseling before they state that. How would you handle it? I would um, process it, listen, talk about how it feels. Then I would get the parent in right away and um, ask about it directly. Then if that occurred, I'd have the parent... Um, ask about it or bring her or him in session and um, process what occurred. Is a child misperceiving what the um, parent, parent did or are they are they um, I would I would address it directly. So that would include and if it's the... happening well, that... oh go ahead. Yeah if the if the other family member whoever they're talking about um, had regular contact with the child and it was an important relationship, I would address it directly. And so that, that would be... That, that would involve bringing the up and then having mom or dad confront the other individual. Is there benefit to just dealing with it with a five-year-old or a six-year-old on an individual level? And not bringing After, grandparents or parents or anyone else in. Um, if if they're bringing up that, and I suspect there's, I'd want to validate it before I am. Um, I would bring everybody in and say what's going on here, and uh, then I would process it with a child. And if I, if it was true, we need to be worked with. You said they took them over to someone. What what was your, the the scenario? Uh, you're saying that the other person took them to their mother's house, or saying that's really your mother, really your father. Is that what your the scenario was? Yes. I would definitely address that. Yes. Is that based upon your uh, based upon literature or uh, and your experience that you would address those types of things with a five or six year old? Uh, yeah, just um, I want to determine the validity of what occurred. We can we can um, clarify it for the child, have the parent clarify it with the child, and um, also confront the other person who did it. And so what are the pitfalls of not bringing in the other people that are allegedly doing something? Um, you, if, if I'm processing an event that may be questionable, I'm reinforcing um, what the child said. I numerous times, um, hundreds of times, had children say, 
dad or mom touched me inappropriately. And if you don't validate that in, this, in a way, the the more that, and then I find out later they did not. And, um, and if I continue to talk about something that didn't happen with the, with the child, it makes it so it happened with the child. And so does that become a scenario where if someone lied, now they are lying over and over again? Yes. And it's harder. It's very difficult to go back on that, even for a child. And so the detriment is that they internalize that and that becomes fact, even though it is not fact, I guess is how I hear that. Correct. It can happen like that. Or they just can't go back and lie because it's, that would be too shameful. Can there be substantial harm caused to a child? I, I just kind of want to wrap this up as I understand. Can there be substantial harm to a child when they do not have contact anymore with a family member or anyone, I guess, that they had substantial contact with before? Yes, there can be harm to the child. Yes. And how would you reestablish that relationship if the court were to grant grandparenting time and it had been a let's say about a nine month period where there had not been contact how would you uh how would you reestablish that contact would it be some kind of graduated time like with parent to parent or how would you do that i recognize i don't have all the facts here this is not on this case just in general i would First, start with the grandparents. I'd have a meeting with them and I'd have a meeting with the um, mom or whoever it is, dad. And then I would say, the court has ordered this. We have to implement it. And um, then um, what are your concerns? I'd ask on both sides. And I would get them together in the um, same room and I'd have them talk about it and develop a plan to assure, number one, appropriate boundaries are being maintained that a schedule is being followed and you go off from pickups and drop-offs and and even mate with the child and say, we're going to start where you're going to visit um, Tuesdays at four or whatever it may be. So, um, the, so they understand what's going on here. And I would talk about the issues related to secrets and privacy and talk about the difference between that. We don't keep secrets, but we have privacy. And um, um, the parents would talk to them and, uh, and and kind of reinforce each other's role in terms of that. And I would begin slowly. And so that could be done with a counselor. Yes. Okay. That's what is I, that? Yes. Is that the most appropriate, especially if a father has a negative view towards the grandparents, or vice versa? Yes, absolutely. Is that because a counselor would act as more like a mediator and be able to establish those boundaries? Yeah, address any concerns each parent have, set up some rules and structure related to it, and um, um, assure there's no triangulation going on with either side, where the parent pits the child or the grandparent pits the child against the other. Um, we're doing this for the best sisters of the child to facilitate relationships. All right. So I got a question. And I apologize up front. It may not be ultimately clear, so I'll work through it. So you, you had talked about in generalities today. Um, and those generalities were based upon your clinical experience and literature. Is that correct? Yeah. If you go to the Department of Corrections um, site, they even have programs that are kind of research-based on there to help facilitate that. It's also evident clinically that um, boundary violations hurt and that maintaining contact with a, a previous attachment that was positive helps. So it's all that in attachment literature, it's, it's there. And that triangulating two parents fighting or uh, two individuals fighting over the child can be harmful. Okay. Um, and so if I heard you correctly, please keep that, that can the attachment or connection with people even that had the boundary violations is still important, is, is what I heard, correct? Well, they would need to be fixed, the boundary violation. Yeah. Right. 
but it's important to have that connection still if there was an extreme contact. Yeah, if there was a lot of contact that was positive in the past, yes. Um, with regards to your testimony here today, um, this information, clinically speaking, and coming from the literature, uh, that's because that, is it true that that happens significant amount of time through the research? And that is why you can speak generally. I guess stated another way, this isn't like it happens only once in a while. Correct. Okay. So. Numerous, yes. Say that again. I've dealt with numerous cases with this. Yes. But but it's a certain high degree that this occurs. Is that correct? And that's why you can speak to this on a clinical experience level and what the literature says. Yes. I don't know about a high degree, but enough of it to be relevant. All right. No, no further questions. Okay. Ms. Reed? Dr. Hagen, you talked about some boundary violations regarding a child being told that like, their parent's not their parent by a grandparent, correct? Correct. And you said that boundary violations can hurt. They can, yes. Okay. And you also said that... Um, we don't keep secrets, we have privacy, is that correct? Correct. So is it harmful to a child for, say, a grandparent to tell the child to keep secrets from a parent under threat that the child might be spanked by the parent if the parent finds out about the secret? Yes, that can be harmful. And when a parent is incarcerated for a period of time, can it be harmful to, say, a six-year-old to tell that child that, you know, the parent's going to be home soon? Yeah, to a five or six-year-old, absolutely. It can be. I mean, it, it doesn't, um, they don't understand what soon is. I'm not sure it's harmful, but it can create some unrealistic expectations in the child. Can it be upsetting for the child to hear that? Can it be upsetting? It'll be upsetting when, if their perception is soon, does not... Um, meet his preconceived idea what soon is. I would tell my grandchild, um, um, we can get an ice cream cone soon. Well, they, I, they don't know what soon is. They want they would perceive that as right now or tonight. So when it, that comes into con, it creates some internal conflict for the child. I don't know if it's traumatic, but it's not something that's healthy. Can you talked a little bit about when, you know, there, there might be some contact with extended family or grandparents and that contact is abruptly ended, that it can be seen as a loss, potentially a traumatic event. Is that correct? Correct. Does your opinion change if the child does not want to see those people? Um, I would... Um, if I'm going with the scenario that was given to me, if um, they they've seen that um, uncle, whatever, whoever it is, um, two, three times a week, um, I would inquiry why are they beginning to my hypothesis would be they just had a bad relationship. They didn't want to go there in the first place. Number two, um, the other parent may have so much an animosity towards whoever they're visiting in that family, they're aligning with the parent. Or um, another hypothesis would be that um, um, they overhear stuff which shape their is the child or being told stuff directly about the other parent, which creates some negative impressions. And then um, I would go from there. And that negative information can be going both ways of why they don't want to see there. It could be coming from the grandparent or extended family members or the parent. Is that correct? Well, that would be what I talked about, triangulation, creating loyalty mm -hmm. conflicts. That's why a lot of times when I see a child clinically, um, they love their mother, the first one, hate their mother, father, the second one. Uh, children, particularly five and six, have shifting loyalties. So... Um, to um, that's why it's important to gather information from a lot of different sources. And then you stated that when the child like makes an allegation, we want to do some sort of investigating into the validity of that allegation to see what's going on, right? Correct.
Correct. And part of that investigative process would be confronting the other person who allegedly said something that the child brought up. In that conflict, in that context, if the parent who mainly has a child finds out someone else is saying something that that jeopardizes his role, that should be addressed directly. Okay. And if the, the parent does address that directly with the party that the child made the allegation against, um, and that confrontation turned physical, do you still recommend that the parties get together in counseling? Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, depending on the quality of that relationship, the history of the family, how they resolved conflicts um, in the past, have these issues occurred in the past, um, and the uh, quality of the relationship with, the, with that parent. So I could, but I couldn't. But and if I... I don't. If I don't see it working, I would err on the side of the child. You had stated that the boundary violations would need to be fixed. How could we ensure by boundary violations are being fixed when we're proposing or stating that there's going to be like unsupervised contact between a boundary violator and a child? Can you say that once more? So maybe I'm a little slow today. Do you want to... So you said that the boundary violations would have to be fixed. And we talked about a couple of different boundary violations. One, telling you know a child that their parent's not their parent and then keeping secrets from the parent. Correct. And we, would need, to, we need to fix those. Correct. So how would we fix the boundary violations and make sure they don't happen again if a boundary violator is having unsupervised contact with a child? Um, I would, uh, I would make, the, I would, um, I'm not the judge here. Don't put me on that level. But the um, I wouldn't recommend a contact until they're fixed between the parents. I would recommend unsupervised contact if it if that was true. It's um, it would have to be resolved between them. Maybe difficult if there's hostility between the parties. There's always hostility. I would expect it. Yes, it's part of the process, yes. If the child does not want to go and see, let's say, a grandparent, would it be harmful to try and force that child to go? Um, I would I would first want to find out why the child doesn't want to see the, the other um, um, parent or family, whatever you're talking about. And I would want to... Um, look at their past relationship with that individual. And I would wonder if they were very positive before, I wonder where the shift came. And um, I would I would explore that prior to making a decision. I have no further questions. Okay. Dr. Haugen, I have just briefly, uh, at one point uh, towards the end, uh, Mr. Bartell asked about, uh, he said, what would be the... Uh, would there be substantial harm to the child if, in fact, uh, the child relationship with that grandparent or other family members was, uh, I guess you'd say, terminated or was not existent at that point? You said, yes, there would be harm to the child. What would the harm be? In terms of just severing a relationship, assuming it was previously um it was previously positive and there was time spent together to form a relationship. A disruption in attachment would create a significant um, grief process, sadness, um, 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 uh, confusion, um, unhappiness. And uh, um, so the traumatic response would be um, a grief response and it could be a fear. You know, um, what did I do wrong? Um, my mother's horrible and my horrible, um, those type of things, depending on the child. It doesn't doesn't have to all the time, but with most of what I've experienced and many other children, it does. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bartell, any uh, redirect? Uh, yes. Is there a shifting chance, is there an increased chance of shifting loyalties with parents if the child is only with one parent all the time? Yes, they're going to be more loyal to the parent they're with the most on a general basis, yes. Is is there, would there be concern for you that the child then is going to be 
with respect to that parent and that parent's family, that side of the family, so to speak, try to put up a front to appease that parent? Yes, that happens frequently. Um, that happens occasionally, yes. And what do you mean One by that? One of the big issues is the if the child believes that um, they're not allowed to grieve, I haven't seen many children. I've I've seen children numerous times in loyalty conflicts, and uh, the parent will say, "Oh, he's doing just fine without his dad. She, and she, she or he is doing wonderful." But when you get him behind closed doors, there's a lot of underlying pain that he's not uh, um, willing to express or or deal with. So uh, you know. I guess what I'm imagining you tell me if this is correct. You have a child that's with the father or mother, whoever it may be, and their family. So they are acting happy. Things are normal, but really underneath, there's a lot of issues going on. Yes. Okay. So that's not abnormal for that to happen. No, it's, it's happened to numerous people I saw. and um, um, That's why... Um, for example, in my case, with my daughter being schizophrenic and paranoid and, and whatever, um, I explained that to him And uh, um, back when he was younger and said, we're going to have to hold off for a little bit because the brain's not working right. It's not your fault. And uh, But I want to maintain that relationship because I, it, it's always his mother. Um, that's his mother. I mean, we're adopting him, yes, but he knows that. And I was startled one day when I heard him talking to his friends, and he'd say, no, it doesn't bother me. But when he talked to his friends in the same situation, it bothered him. And that's happened to me numerous times in the clinical, um, in my clinical practice. Is there issues when uh, one parent unilaterally decides to put a child into counseling without the agreement of the other parent? Um, I prefer most of the time that both parents be involved with it. And why is that? I, I only get one side of the story. And so if that one parent and is and the step parent with that child are the only contacts with that counselor, would that give you concern as to what is happening? I don't know about, about a concern, but it's probably going to um, make the... It, the, it won't give the therapist a full perspective on what's going on. So if you're really trying to fix it, you should have everyone involved. Is that what I'm hearing? In this scenario described to me, you have to have everyone involved, right? Is there an increased chance that a minor child, about five or six years old, uh, to go back to the maybe the internalization? You know, what what I mean is that they act like they're happy or things are okay with the one side of the family. It does it does that happen at an increased, I guess, time, I guess, if there is either physical abuse or threat of physical abuse as well? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. So so you had indicated that uh that it can yeah, that was poorly worded. Um if there is physical abuse or threat of physical abuse is there an increased chance that the minor child is going to internalize maybe unhappy negative sad views to appease those parents or that yes. parent or step parent the young child perceives the consequences of not aligning with that parent as severe or even more negative, there is uh, more of a likelihood of that, yes. And therefore, it can distort things the child may say in counseling as well, if yeah. that is happening at home? Yes. No further questions. Okay. Ms. Reed. Dr. Hogan, you said that it occasionally happens that um, a child will internalize and and appear happy and try and bury those feelings. Is that correct? When there's underlying issues correct. going on? And so in, in a particular case, when the child hasn't seen, say, grandparents or extended family in almost 10 months, and there's been no behavior change since before the contact stopped and after the contact stopped, that would be concerning? 
concerning regarding not having a behavior change? Yes. I think that would be um, um, not having a behavior. Would that be concerning that they didn't have a behavior change? No, it wouldn't be concerning. I so still think it would need to be explored, um, but um, at that age, if you're talking still six or seven, or whatever, they're going to um, adopt uh, um, the position of that parent. So if she's still just a, if the child's still happy and and she's doing well in school, she did not disclosing to anybody that she's upset or grieving or sad. You would still think there's a substantial risk of harm. Um, there's more of a risk of harm than later on as they emerge into um, their um, preteen and teen years when they try to wrap their head around what occurred. Very similar to um, sexual abuse, where a child may not be injured at five or six, but uh, later on realize what happened and the, then the, the, the symptoms come. I have no further questions. Dr. Haugen, just to follow up on that, what Ms. Reed stated is, would you find that unusual if, in fact, as she states, uh, the child after the loss, let's say, of a parent or other side of the family, that that child would, again, function as they had prior to that loss? I would say some children do that. Um, um, I would find it unusual, although it is possible that it wouldn't um, come out later on as they're beginning to understand more what occurred. Okay. If the child continues to act and uh, react as they had prior to that loss, is that an indication that there was no harm experienced by the child? No, it would. It, it may be, again, we're in hypothetical here. It may be an indication that the child's just burying it and not buried it and not dealing with it at that time. Okay. Mr. Bartell, anything else? Um, nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Reed? Just quickly, Dr. Haugen, so you said that it, it may be that they're bearing with it or not dealing with it? Objection has to answer. I mean, she can argue at the end and highlight whatever she wants. It's kind of a theme. I can ask a different question. Well, go ahead, Ms. Reed. Well, Dr. Haugen, could it be that this child is completely happy, fine, and not bearing it at all? Yeah, I guess it could be anything, I guess. I mean, but uh, I haven't seen that very often. But I suppose, depending on the child's temperament and um, previous coping abilities, um, some children do, yes. I have no further questions. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Bartow? Okay. So, and I understand, Dr. Hogan, I, I'm going to preface again, you haven't seen the child or whatever. <laughs> um, and you had said that you hadn't seen it happen very often to Ms. Reed's question. Um, I guess you would have to take that in the context of whether or not there's verbal and physical abuse by the parent and step parent at home and what processes were occurring with regards to unilateral decisions to the counselor and who was involved and basically everything else you had said. Is that correct? Yes, you'd have to um, put it all into context, yes. So if we have secret counseling, unilateral counseling, and we have testimony that the grandparents were not involved at all with counseling and the counselor did not get anyone else involved and that there's been abuse or at least verbal abuse by a stepmother, do you think that would change your, I mean, would that give you extreme concern that the child may be suppressing things? Um, that would be a, high, a big hypothesis I'd entertain, yes. And that would be consistent with the literature and your clinical experience? Yes. No further questions. Anything else, Ms. Reed? Yes, Your Honor. So, Dr. Haugen, if the testimony came out that there wasn't secret counseling and that the parent knew about it and the counselor was trying to investigate some of these allegations and this counselor was working with the child for nine or 10 months and that counseling was abruptly ended by a parent 
and that they were working through those issues and there were none of these allegations or there no there's no abuse physical or emotional abuse going on and that there was some se severe significant boundary violations done by the grandparent against this child triangulating the grandparent against father to keep secrets and telling the child that the father is not the father would that change your opinion i guess Wait, I, mean, I wouldn't have an opinion because i didn't see him myself i'd have to put the whole thing into context yes that can that could um that part of it could be I'd have to assess the prior relationships, the relevance of that prior relationship, and um, dig on the child a little bit. Um, it's really hard to say with any certainty um, that the court demands that it is or isn't, right? So you can't say like 100% that this child's at a substantial risk of harm? Objection, Your Honor. I, I don't think they talk in 100% certainties, but... I would say, I don't know, 100%, but there's certainly a risk for the child, yes. And no further questions. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Bartow? Dr. Hagen, do you ever have 100% certainties in your profession? I I don't have that in my life. No, not at all. Okay. So we just talk about degrees of harm based upon your experience and clinical experience and 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 what the literature says, is that correct? Correct. Okay. You could say accurately that all sexually abused people aren't traumatized, uh, are, aren't necessarily traumatized. There is some people who are sexually abused that don't exhibit very many trauma symptoms. Not common, but it occurs. It's not popular in the literature either, but it, it occurs. And and like I and like we I percent certainty. Right. But it most of the time, often it occurs that the, the child demonstrates some harm. And so what you testified here today was based upon your clinical experience and literature and talks about what happens often. Is that correct? Right. All right, no further questions. Okay, Ms. Reed, anything else? No, Your Honor. Okay, Dr. Haugen, uh, that will conclude your testimony. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a great day. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bartell, next witness. Yeah, so I'm going to call Stephanie Plain. <clears throat> okay, here she comes. Hold on. She was there. Oh, okay. You're still muted, ma'am. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <clears throat> One second before we have you testify. Ms. Toledo, if you could, when you're moving around, please cover your screen. It's very distracting. Yeah, either sit in one place still or cover, cover it so we don't see it as you're moving about. Okay, thank you. Ms. Plain, we're going to take some testimony from you, so we need to have you raise your right hand, be sworn in, then we'll proceed. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. <clears throat> oh, Ms. Lane, can you uh, state your full name for the record, spell in your last? Stephanie Lynn Plain, P-L-A-N-E. And uh, do you know a Kelsey Cronkite? I do. And how do you know her? She is my granddaughter. And um, when's the last time you've seen her? In April. Um, do you know a Chloe Cronkite? I do. And how do you know her? She is my bonus great-granddaughter through marriage. Okay. And you know Ori Cronkite? I do. And who is he to you? He is my granddaughter's husband, so my step-grandson. And let me ask, hey, have you in the past seen Kelsey engage with Chloe? Many times. Okay. Uh, have you ever seen her bad mouth Taylor Morgan in front of the Meyer child? Not Taylor, no. Okay. Uh, how would you indicate that Kelsey's demeanor towards 
I mean, let me rephrase that. Have you ever seen her scream at Chloe? Yes, several times. Okay. Um, the best you could tell, at least the reaction from uh, Chloe. Uh, how did Chloe take that? It it appeared that she it scared her. Anytime and, children are yelled at, it scares them. And let me, without saying specifically what uh, Kelsey said, um, was she, what was the reason why she was screaming at Chloe? Kelsey has a short temper. And if Chloe um, maybe did something that displeased Kelsey, um, if she if she lied to her or if she picked on her brother, um, Kelsey loses her temper easily. <clears throat> and you'd seen that more than one time? Yes, I have. And did you ever confront Kelsey with regards to that? No. And why not? Because of her short temper. And as a grandparent, I'm a great grandparent now. It is it has never been beneficial to interrupt her behavior or give her an opinion as a as a grandmother who has raised two children that I was always afraid that what has happened since April would happen and that is I can no longer see her children or Chloe so and so is it fair to say that you would walk on eggshells with Kelsey for fear of not being able to see your grandchildren? Absolutely. It's always been that way. Is that I object, she... I, how is this relevant to the grandparenting time case now? Okay, Mr. Barkell, yeah. how is it relevant? Well, we just got off testimony from Dr. Howard, where he was talking about the dynamics between a parent and a step parent, including yelling and screaming and physical violence and how that can affect a child and what is going on here. This this fits perfectly in what we're talking about. The response, Ms. Reed? But how is Stephanie's relationship with Kelsey relevant to the grandparenting time case before? It is foundation, Your Honor, to indicate what she was doing, the interaction with Kelsey, and how Kelsey has always been around her and the children. I'll allow for a limited purpose. We don't need to go into it too much, but obviously because we have to look at best interests, the court will consider it. Ms. Plain, is it fair to say that you'd walk on eggshells around Kelsey? Often, yes. Yeah. Um, did it appear that Kelsey would control the situation or all situations with the children? Um, most always, because she was 90% parenting with all three children and previously all four children. Okay. And when you say she was the one parenting, was Ori around much? Ori worked long hours all summer, spring, fall. He had a very he had a very busy job and he was the only only working person in the family. And did you see Kelsey control Chloe? Oh yes, certainly. In which ways would you see her control Chloe? But just like any parent, she she was in charge. Did there ever come a point when Kelsey told you that Chloe was lying to her all the time? Yes. And when was that? In December of 23, around the holidays. It was after her and Ori um, came home from their week trip to Florida, the week of Thanksgiving. So it was after that, it was in, in early to mid-December. I guess, and how I, did that even, oh, go ahead. I was... I was at their home, and she um, was confiding in me that um, Chloe was lying to her all the time, and it was becoming a problem. And as well, she complained about um, Uriah, that he was becoming very aggressive, and so that's when it was. <clears throat> And when did your relationship with Kelsey begin to sour? In um, late January of this year. Okay. And why was that? She was planning their um, 
end of February trip to Florida and I'm going to object, Your Honor. I still don't see why a relationship souring is relevant to grandparenting time. How is that? I guess, Your Honor, I guess I can rephrase it and get it to the point. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Miss Plain, did there ever come a time that uh, Kelsey wanted to borrow your car and put the children in danger? Yes. Okay. Could you describe that situation to the court? She asked if I could pick them up at the airport and and take them to their um, hotel. And I after I thought about it, at first I said, of course I will. And then after I thought about it, after we had hung up, I realized that my Subaru Forester does not fit six people. It only fits five people and without car seats in the only back seat, with only two adults in the front, you can't fit another adult and three children in my back seat, which to include Chloe, who was five years old at the time. So I um, um, texted her, Kelsey, Kelsey gets so angry so quickly that I, I can't have a calm conversation and so as walking on eggshells, like I said, I texted her. She she constantly prefers texting to speaking. And I said, Kelsey, I texted her. I said, I realized you're going to have to get a larger vehicle. Six of us. Uh, one, two, I'm going to object again, Your Honor. I don't see how any of this is relevant to grandparenting time. Okay, Mr. Bartow. Well, I mean, the testimony overwhelming majority of the people, including family on the other side, has indicated that Kelsey takes care of all of the children, including Chloe. We have heard her anger and whatever else, and this goes to the best interest factors because Mr. Cronkite has no issue with his wife putting the children at risk. So it still goes to the best interest factors that the court may have to consider. Okay, well... I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. So I, um, when I told Kelsey that she was going to have to get a larger vehicle because um, because of the tragedy that happened in 2022 that caused the death of our first great grandchild, her first child, I said that I would I wouldn't drive 10 minutes with those children not safe in the car, and she became angry with me and started um, texting me, telling me, uh, don't, don't call me. You're stressing I'm going to object to hearsay. Sustained. But she became angry, Ms. Plain? Pardon me? She became angry? Uh, well, uh, by text, she became angry, yes. And then she didn't talk to you after that? No. Okay. <clears throat> not, One other not. thing. Oh, did you... When was the last time you had an encounter with Mr. Cronkite? Please repeat that. When was the last time you had an inner encounter with Mr. Cronkite? Oh, I had an encounter with Ori Cronkite on a Sunday afternoon on a freeway, a very busy freeway on a Sunday after church. And I went, I drove to a nursery. They had a big sale on plants. And my sister-in-law had asked me to look for some for her. And as I left the nursery and I turned north onto M66, I noticed immediately in my rear view mirror a huge, quite oversized truck on my tail. I mean, right almost up against my bike rack that's attached to my vehicle. And I, upon looking, I realized that was Ori Cronkite's truck. I thought it was. And his truck stayed on my tail. And I just drove maybe 50 miles an hour I, at the speed limit. And after about maybe a minute of him being right on my tail, no distance between us. He pulled into the 
oncoming lane sped up ahead of me in front of me and then he slammed on his brakes if i hadn't been in good control of my car i would have slammed into the back of his truck and then he stayed in my front bumper and after 30 45 seconds of that i i tried to pull into the passing lane to maybe get around him and then i saw him pointing at his cell phone with his window rolled down so i recognized exactly who it was and I tried to pull around him and he swerved his truck into my vehicle and I had to swerve over into the southbound lane and almost into the the ditch at which I dropped back behind Ori's truck and he stayed right in front of me and then he was pointing for me wanting the appearing that he wanted me to pull over to the side of the road. I had no idea what Ori would do, so I just stayed behind him. By that time, I dialed 911 and got a dispatcher. She told me to pull off to the next road. No, you road. can't say hearsay. And so we got to near Station 66, the restaurant. Okay. So you had this encounter where he had almost run you off the road? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you have not had any contact with them since then? No. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Reed, any questions? I have no questions for this witness. Okay. Ms. Plain, that will conclude your testimony. You're free to go. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Mr. Bartell, next witness. No further witnesses, Your Honor. We rest. Okay. Just making some notes. Ms. Reed, uh, a note, uh, not that it's late, but uh, we're coming up on the noon hour. I didn't know if you had planned to have witnesses in this morning or start this afternoon or what. So, uh, what? Allison Bartha still around. I'd like to call her so she can go. Yes, she might have patients she needs to do. Yes, she's still here. Let me. Bring okay, her. we'll go then. I just didn't know what you had planned. And and just so I understand, Your Honor, um, I anticipate she's going to be a long one. So should we just do the direct and then? I guess we can see where it goes. It, it may go for a while. Let's let's see where it goes. If we have to go into the noon hour for a little bit, we can do that. All right. <clears throat> Please unmute, Miss Bartha. Can you hear us, ma'am? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Miss Bartha, we're going to take some testimony. So if you would raise your right hand, we'll have you sworn in, then we'll proceed. Raise your hand, please. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead, Ms. Bree. Ms. Bartha, can you state and spell your last name? Allison Bartha, B as in boy, A-R-T-H-A. -A. And where do you work? Grace Hall Family Practice in Battle Creek. And what is your title there? I am a behavioral health consultant. And how long have you been at Grace Health? I have been employed at Grace Health for nine years. I've been in the behavioral health consultant role for about four. And what does a behavioral health consultant do? We see and treat mental health uh, clients. You treat children? I do. Do you have any sort of licenses? I have a license in social work through the state of Michigan. Do you attend any like classes to maintain that license? Uh, we do, we do continuing education. Do you possess any degrees? I have my um, associates, my bachelor's, and my master's. And what are those in? My associates is in human services, and my bachelor's and master's is in social work. Do you specialize in any particular social work field? I particularly see um, like PTSD, anxiety, depression. Um, I keep my schedule open for kids and adults. I wouldn't say that I have like a narrow specialization or credentialed in a specific area or field. Okay, and do you know a Chloe Cronkite? I do. And were you seeing Chloe Cronkite for counseling purposes? I was. And how was that arranged? She uh, was put on my schedule. Were, were you like specifically requested? I believe so, yeah. And do you have previous contact with the Cronkite family? Do I have previous? Are you seeing anybody else with the Cronkite family? As far as treatment? Yes. 
Um, I believe that would be a violation of my HIPAA to expose my caseloads. And Ms. Reed, what's, what's your response? Um, I can ask a different question. Okay, thank you. How long were you treating Chloe? Um, I have here. Your Honor, I'm going to object if she's looking at notes. She's got to go off her memory. And there's a process to go through other ones. Well, maybe if you need to, uh, Ms. Reed, to get her to refresh her memory. Do you know if it was the beginning of this year? I would say, yeah, beginning of this year, end of last year, if I had and, to guess, yeah. And do you know how long you were treating Chloe for? It was quite a few months. It was an extended period of time, yeah. And what was the reason for counseling? Um, I believe she was brought to me due to a change in routine, um, was routinely seeing her grandparents um, and talking to her mom, and it, it kind of stopped. So she was brought to me due to change of routine and some behavioral outbursts or some anxiety that we were working on. And what tools and techniques are being explored in counseling to help deal with the change and her anxiety? I focus a lot of on hands on. Your if I, if I can, now that we've gotten into the, um, now we're testifying about uh, seeing Chloe, I'm going to object to her testimony. I'm going to say that because we already have testimony from Miss Morgan that this was you know, unilaterally done. This court has the inherent authority to strike any testimony or evidence or anything that was obtained through an unlawful purpose. Um, and therefore, this court has the ability to decide whether or not it will allow this type of uh, testimony. I say that because uh, the parent's decision-making authority, uh, what we talked about earlier with Ms. Morgan is that she did not agree to this counseling. And um, like I said, this court has the inherent authority to strike anything that was wrongfully obtained, uh, uh, whether it's a pleading or evidence uh, in any particular matter. Okay. Ms. Reed, what's your response? Well, it's our position, Your Honor, that Ms. Morgan agreed to this counseling initially, even though now she says she didn't. This counseling went on for a period of nine months. There was no unlawful purpose for this counseling, and this counselor can provide information to the court regarding the best interest of the child and if there is a substantial risk of harm to this child. Okay. Mr. Bartel, does that uh, address your objection? Uh, not really. Just saying that a person can address different factors uh, isn't really on point with regards to what this court has in front of it is testimony from Taylor Morgan herself, who indicated I did not agree to this counselor uh, seeing my child. Um, I guess the inquiry could be of this counselor as to whether or not she re she received a waiver and consent from both parents, which I will submit to the court. This counselor, in fact, did not. Well, why don't I, Mr. Bartel, I'll give you an opportunity to voir dire the uh, witness and then we can see what happens. So, uh, Ms. Bartha, did you ever, did you know who the mother of Chloe is? Yes. And and who did, how did you get that information? Through Chloe. Okay. Did you get any information from the father? No. Okay. And did you get any information from uh, Chloe's stepmother? No. Okay. And so you had someone come, what is your process at Grace Health? Uh, to ensure that there has been authorization given for a child to see you? They will schedule an appointment with our receptionist and the receptionist do and file all of that paperwork. Um, and then she's placed on my schedule. Okay. And does your uh, facility have uh, forms for both parents to sign to consent to the treatment? I don't know that I can speak on that because I haven't been trained as far as like the paperwork process that has to be filled out when a new patient is being established in our facility. Okay. And are you aware of your facility ever getting a consent uh, from Ms. Morgan to treat Chloe? 
Yeah, I don't know that I can speak on that either. And it was your understanding that uh, Miss Morgan and Mr. Cronkite were not together, correct? Yeah, yes. I didn't know that. Okay. And, and was it your understanding that they may not have agreed on uh, various things and have been involved in the court system before with regards to custody with Bowie? That was not my understanding, no. But you did not inquire either about that. Is that correct? Um, not unless it was brought up in sessions with Chloe that her mom was incarcerated. We would we would talk about some phone calls that she would have. Okay, but you never inquired from the father. Is that correct? No. Is there a reason why you wouldn't have any conversations with the father? That's that's out of my my job duties at Grace Health to to inquire information about that. That would have already been done through the initial intake process when they scheduled the appointment. And do you have a particular supervisor at your place that I supervises do. your work? I do. And who is that? Dr. McLeod. I guess, Your Honor, I would still uh, renew my objection. There's no information here that had indicated that there was a waiver and consent for such counseling to occur with um, Chloe in this particular matter. We had only uh, one side bringing Chloe in for particular counseling. There is joint legal custody. Mr. Cronkite has a history of unilaterally doing things, and he is fully aware of um, how this process works. He's not new to the court system, and the court obviously understands that given the extensive history uh, in this particular matter. Okay. Ms. Reed, what's your response? I still do not see how this was for an unlawful purpose. The child needed counseling. It was placed in counseling. And this witness can offer the court information that is up to date, at least until counseling was stopped as of a couple months ago. Okay. If I could respond, Your Honor, yeah. uh, they just they just admitted essentially that we, we got the information. It was for a lawful purpose to seek counseling. And guess what? It was... It was Mr. Cronkite who filed a motion the day after, I think it was our last hearing or the hearing before, asking for counseling to continue. He knows the process, and they're still not addressing that he knows the process. And legal custody means that both parents agree on what's going to happen with regards to important decision-making concerning the minor child, which clearly includes uh, mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. Any response, Ms. Reed? We did file motions to continue counseling, but custody and parenting time issues are a separate and distinct issue rather than, you can't combine them with grandparenting time. If we're having custody and parenting time issues, then you bring that in the custody case under a parenting time issue or a, the custody issue or whatever it may be because Ms. Morgan is in prison. This witness is here to testify about this child's best interest and substantial risk of harm regarding grandparenting time. These are two different issues. Well, maybe two different issues, Ms. Reed, but obviously Ms. Morgan does have joint legal custody. And with joint legal custody comes all sorts of, uh, again, responsibilities and privileges, if you would. And that's to make important decisions concerning the child's well-being, their health, and all sorts of other things. It's spelled out usually in the uh, custody order. And uh, in this particular case, Mr. Conkright has physical custody, but the parties share legal custody. And in this case, the defendant has testified that she did not agree to the counseling. She wouldn't agree to the counseling. In fact, she fought that and it was fought when it came before me. I discontinued the counseling because it would not be consented to. Today, Ms. Barthas sought there's going to be testimony concerning the child and we don't have a waiver uh, signed by Ms. Morgan or consent for the counseling or consent for her to testify as to those issues, which she has a right as a parent to do. So the court does believe that, uh, again, uh, there, at least as it relates to that uh, joint legal custody that she maintains and retains those rights. And there's been no waiver of consent to that. So the court is going to bar the testimony of Ms. Bartha at uh, at this particular time, unless there should be a waiver or consent at some point in the future. 
So, Ms. Bartha, I guess that will conclude your testimony. You're free to go. Thank you. Next witness, Ms. Reed. My next witness is going to be Ari, and that's going to be another long one. So I would not object if the court wants to break or continue. Why don't we do this? Why don't we break and uh, then we'll come back at uh, why don't we come back at start at one o'clock? 